Hi, how you doing? My name's Brandon, and today I have a very bold, very controversial claim to make. Video games are good. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Hey, 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 hey calm down. I understand how brave I am to come forward and make such a bold statement that no one else is willing to make. All joking aside, though, gaming is a really cool hobby, pastime, art form, whatever you want to call it. Over the course of the last 40-so years, video games have taken the world by storm, and... <coughs> Gamers have risen up, and games are debatably better than they've ever been. However, I'm not here to talk about that today, and honestly, you're probably not here to listen to me talk about that. So let's segue into the video flawlessly. As a child, I was obsessed with video games. The first time I played a video game was Mario Kart Wii in a children's hospital when I was six years old when my brother was first diagnosed with diabetes. And not even a month later, my parents gave my brother an IDS lights, and since then it's been a downhill slope into the wonderful land of depression. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, may maybe not, but only slightly. I got a Wii later that year for Christmas, and I was one of the six people who actually owned a Wii U, so I was pretty much raised on Nintendo. Pokemon Black and White? Still the best generation. There's an actual hot take for you right there. Donkey Kong Country Returns? Great game. Tropical Freeze? I'm still working on that one, even though it's been, what, six years? Smash Bros. and Mario Kart? I've never hated my brother more. Then, everything changed when- I got into middle school. So, going into middle school, besides puberty, there were some other changes going on with me. I made some actual friends, and when that came sleepovers and hanging out, where I was introduced to the Xbox 360, which was the console that half of my friends had. My mind was blown. I was used to all these platformers and Zeldas and family-friendly Nintendo games, and all of a sudden, I get introduced to... <laughs> It was a pretty big shock to my small 12-year-old walnut-sized brain. Continuing middle school, I got a PlayStation 3 in 6th grade, then an Xbox 360 going into 8th grade. After the Xbox One came out. For my 14th birthday, I finally got an Xbox One, and then I got a Switch when that came out. I spent almost all of my free time in middle school playing video games. Infamous 1 and 2, Wind Waker HD, Batman Arkham, Skyrim, Fallout 4. Hey, I said these were games I played, not games that I liked. And on top of all of this, tons of Minecraft and Team Fortress 2. I was a true bona fide gamer. It was really my only hobby, which is a big yikes for any 14 year old going into his freshman year. Which brings me to. So, freshman year comes around, and all of a sudden, I find myself with much more things to do and absolutely no free time. Marching band? Fuck yeah, bro, give me more things to do. High school plays? More! How about the Algebra 2 homework my teacher expected me to do every night? <laughs> now that's too far. Anyways, even though I got my Switch, I found my interest wandering towards other things, as is normal for people once they get into high school. The majority of things that I played were games that I already owned, namely Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey, but I didn't really touch either of those games after I beat them once. Sophomore year came around, and really the only game I touched was Destiny 2 over the summer with some friends, and from there on my primary interests were music and Dungeons and Dragons. I honestly can't remember any games that I even played for a considerable amount of time my junior year of high school. And going into senior year, I expected it to be the same thing, until I decided to buy myself a video game during some Christmas shopping with my girlfriend at the mall. And that game was Dragon Quest XI, Echoes of an Elusive Age, the game that revived my love of gaming. A bit of background information before I get into this. Dragon Quest is an incredibly successful series of RPGs that pretty much invented the JRPG genre of video games. However, they were never as popular in the West as they were in Japan. With that in mind, let's dive in. Dragon Quest XI Echoes of an Elusive Age originally came out for the PlayStation 4 and the 3DS in July of 2017. A Steam release came in September 2018, and a Nintendo Switch version came out in September of 2019, this time branded as Dragon Quest XI-S. This release of the game added many things that were not present in the original releases, some more strange than others. The Switch board added Japanese voice acting, the 2D 16-bit mode, and an orchestral score. This is the version that I picked up as I had heard some good things about the game, and I didn't have a PS4 or a decent PC at the time. I sunk around 85 hours into the game, and I loved almost every second of it. Honestly, it feels like every detail of this game was made by people who give a shit, which is especially important when some games just feel like they were made to get a quick buck out of the player. Getting more in-depth with the game, I guess we should start with two things that really carry the game, the story, and the characters. Alright, let's get this out of the way real quick. The story of this game is nothing groundbreaking. It's not a revolutionary narrative that will leave you impressed at its complexities or analyzing it, picking it apart. But honestly, it doesn't need to be. Spoiler warning, skip ahead to the time on screen if you don't want the story spoiled, I'm spoiling the whole thing. The game split into three acts, with almost all promotional material for the game taking place during the first act of the game. Granted, that's still around 25 to 30 hours of content. So, you are the chosen one, the Luminary, and it's your destiny to defeat the Dark One, Mordigan. 
Once you come of age, your village ships you out to the capital to see the king so that you can save the world and fulfill your destiny. And that just sounds about like the most generic fantasy plot imaginable, which is what the game relies on. Then, you go to see the king. And as it turns out, the entire world hates you, and the king has you thrown into the dungeon. Now look at that, your expectations just got subverted. So, you get out of jail with your new best friend, and you begin your adventure. You go and meet this tiny girl, Veronica, who's looking for her sister, and she looks just like a kid. So you think you're gonna go look for another dumb, stupid kid. And then as it turns out, her sister's the best girl in the entire game. BAM! Subverted again! Then you keep going to all these places looking for this branch, and you keep getting your expectations subverted. The prince from this horse race town is a total pussy and you have to do his job for him. Then you get to this mask place and you find a hot girl in Master Roshi and BAM! Your expectations are subverted. He's your grandpa and he's been trying to fight the Dark One too. Okay, maybe not. That was not that. Okay. But anyways, you get all six MacGuffins and start making your way towards Yggdrasil, the World Tree. And you think, oh shit, time to kick some Dark One ass. And then you get up there and you get your teeth kicked in. And as the screen goes to black after the glorious cutscene, it leans out of your switch and it whispers into your ear. Hey, those expectations you had. They just got some up! Now, Act 2 starts, and you do some boring side stories that were honestly way too long with flamboyant hot girl Masiroshi and best friend that take way too long being around an hour each, before finally getting to play as our hero once again. But once you do, you regain consciousness and realize that having the Dark One take over the world probably isn't a good thing. Oh, so, you start shit. rebuilding your merry band of misfits, and the game teams you up with one of the dudes who is actively trying to kill you during Act 1, which is a nice sub- Would someone stop these people from yelling- Subversion of expectations. <laughs> Anyways, you get your traveling circus back together and start recollecting the MacGuffins, seeing how each area you previously explored got changed from the evil dude taking over. Then, you find out the tiny girl died saving your ass when the world tree committed boom. You go and square up with the dark one for real this time after summoning a flying sky whale using a fishing rod. That doesn't sound like a real sentence, but hey, we're going with it. So you square up with the dark one and kick his ass, beating the main story. But wait, I said there were three X. Well, then we get into the post game, which is enough to warrant its own section of the video later on. Now, all that stuff I mentioned is just the main story of the game, and it's not even mentioning the weird B story stuff that happens. Like this one bit in the Central American town where you get sucked into a painting inside of ruin walls. There's another bit where you meet a mermaid who's been waiting for her fiance to return, but then you find out that the mermaid's been waiting for 80 years and the guy died and had a grandkid, so you go and reunite them. The story of this game is nothing insane, but its use of tropes works to its benefit to surprise the player occasionally. Hell, there were parts in this game where I was actually genuinely surprised, and I probably had a big dumb smile on my face. Story-driven games live and die based off of their characters, and Dragon Quest XI doesn't disappoint in this aspect. Each character in this game is genuinely enjoyable, each with their own personality traits and class role that you uncover over the course of the game. Eric is the first character who joins your party, and he pretty quickly gets relegated to just being the main character's best friend. Despite filling the best friend role in the party, Eric does actually have his own personality. He's usually the member of the party who comes back with a snarky quip to the NPCs you interact with, and for the first bit of the game, he comes off as a bit of a dick, acting almost entirely out of his own self-interest. This changes over the course of the game, especially during Act 1, with Eric becoming a valued member of your party. They give him his own bit of mystery with the Scandinavian town you get to about three quarters of the way through Act 1, where Eric is very awkward and refuses to enter the town. All of this leading to the player, or at least me, taking away that Eric is a thief from said Scandinavian town who primarily had his own interests in mind, but through joining with the Luminary through Destiny or whatever, learns to put his own interests aside and help others out for the greater good. But then Act 2 comes around and gives him amnesia, or narrative tension. Eric gets stuck in a floating sky prison, and in a last ditch bid to escape, trades his memories for his life. So then, you go back to the Scandinavian ice town, and since he has no memories of his identity, he actually goes into town this time, which causes a priest to dump narrative on you, explaining that Eric used to live near this place with the Vikings and his sister, who wasn't mentioned for the entirety of Act 1. You go to his old house, and you get more expedition dumped on you, finding out that Eric accidentally cursed his sister, causing him to run away from his problems to seek forgiveness for this mistake. You fix Eric's mistake, and he returns to being his old chipper self for the rest of the game, giving a nice little message about how you can't run away from your problems, as doing that caused Eric's sister to transform into a MacGuffin monster. Veronica is the battle mage of your party, and she's also the law. For my non-degenerate viewers, she's an adult that because of magic is now stuck inside of the body of a 10 year old girl. It's very awkward and personally I'm not a fan of that stuff in video games or any kinds of media, especially since the model of adult Veronica is in the game. Anyways, personality wise, Veronica comes off as brash, often being the member of the party who picks fights, with others often leading to wacky and zany hijinks, like getting a dude kicked out of a bar for ignoring his child. 
Anyways, Veronica doesn't really get much of an arc through the game. She stays static for most of it, almost taking a tsundere role towards the luminary, which I see as a missed opportunity. I mean, hell, she gets put back into her adult body for a thing later on in the game, and then isn't perturbed in the slightest when she goes back to looking like a child. Feels like they made Veronica look like a kid just to tick off some child party member box, which is a real shame because this concept has a lot of potential. Acting as the foil to her sister, Serena is the healing mage of your party with a calm and peaceful demeanor to go with it. Being the younger twin, Serena is often following in Veronica's footsteps. Throughout the game, the player is constantly shown the two interacting, with Veronica leading and Serena following, culminating in a cutscene in the final area of Act 1, with Serena asking that since her and Veronica were born at the same time, whether or not they'll die at the same time, which some might find foreshadowing. Aside from this, the scene really establishes the idea that Serena really relies on her sister to keep her going, which is explored further in Act 2, where Serena is forced to rely on herself for the first time. Anyways, this change in independence is of course shown through a haircut. Gameplay-wise, this is also shown with her taking up Veronica's abilities and spells, showing that though Veronica may be gone, she's still with her sister and the party. Despite not taking a large personality change and remaining the second most bubbly member of the party, Serena still goes through a nice bit of development, until the postgame comes around. Sylvando is the most extra character in the entire game, and perhaps any other video game, and I love it. Between the voice, Morning, darling. the mannerisms, the outfits, it's all so extra, and on top of that, there's an actual character hiding beneath all of it. Sylvando takes the role of the jack of all trades in your party, which reflects the different aspects of his life. In Act 1, beneath all the flamboyant performance aspects, Sylvando is shown to be unusually well informed with topics of knighthood and chivalry. A bit weird at the time, but it's played off as having approximate knowledge of many topics. Then, you get to a port town where Sylvando gets all weird and refuses to enter. Hey, I've seen this one before. Then, Act 2 comes around and it turns out that Sylvando ran away from his father, a well-renowned knight, for wanting to perform instead of following his footsteps. Refusing to return home because of his fear of his father not accepting his new lifestyle, when you finally force him to face his fears, his father accepts him and even teaches the party a new power. Wow, a nice little thing about accepting who you really are. So, as I mentioned earlier in the video, Rab is your grandpa, who delivers a hearty exposition dump about halfway through Act 1, teaching you that you're actually the prince of a ruined country, and that he was the former king. Throughout the game, we see Rab focus primarily on defeating the Dark One, however, we do see moments of Rab trying to be a good peepaw, leading to an ending where he cries after you call him peepaw, and then he shows you his lewd magazine collection. Let's talk about that now, he's a total perv. <laughs> Hence the Master Roshi similarities when you consider they're both horny martial arts masters. I'm not gonna lie, the first time the pervert bit comes up, it's pretty funny, but the second time, the joke repeats itself and it doesn't really land as well. So, beneath the pervy jokes, we also have a character begging for some development, which the game serves on a nice silver plate in the ruins of Rab's old castle. You end up going on a journey twice of allowing the souls of your family to be laid to rest, once for your mother, and again later for your father, giving a nice insight into Rab's perceived guilt over this. Additionally, we see Rab give up a potentially happy life where nothing bad happens in a dream to continue his mission of defeating the Dark One. Damn, it really does feel like every character got something to do in this game except for Veronica. In a very close second place for the title of Best Girl, Jade is your warrior princess character, literally. She has no spells and is actually the princess of the kingdom that tried to get you arrested earlier in the game. Her arc revolves around her father, the king, being possessed by the Dark One, which explains why you were almost arrested and killed. Throughout the game, we see this eating Jade up, fueling her with vengeance for that final battle. Jade also gets this thing where she cared for the Luminary when they were an infant. Kinda weird, but whatever. This leads to her going out of her way to make sure that you stay safe throughout the game in one instance causing her to literally jump off of a cliff to save you, then immediately making sure you're okay. I'm not gonna lie, the best girl contest is horribly close between Jade and Serena, and I think the only reason that Serena wins is because of creepy game design. The game needs to make sure that you understand that Jade is a hot, sexy warrior princess. I mean, hell, there's a whole section of her skill tree about skills like sexy beam, hip drop where she slams her ass into the opponent, and how could I forget Puff Puff, which if you're unfamiliar with the series, then Google it. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with promiscuity, but it's kind of annoying when there's an entire hour of the game where the character's forced to wear a Playboy Bunny outfit, and it's just sometimes forced on during one of the character's better combat abilities. Anyways, my opinion is just that, and I understand that there's a cultural gap between here and Japan. A redeeming grace, though, is that there's a caring personality laying the foundation for this character, as opposed to having her just be a sex object. Silver lining?
Character 8 is the best character in the entire game. There's a story of redemption, guilt, betrayal, trust, and loyalty waiting for you in Acts 2 and 3. And honestly, you just have to see it for yourself because I really don't want to spoil it. The sense of camaraderie between him and the Luminary grows through the game to his ending, and it is glorious. Well, that's all the characters in the story, but I guess the next question would be, how does the game actually play and look? Well, look no further. I think it's pretty safe for me to say that the gameplay is split into two main parts, exploration and combat, with some mini-games mixed into the exploration bit that are optional. Starting with exploration, the game world is linear, you're often going from point A to point B. However, each of the game's cities, and for lack of a better word, roots, feels huge. Each city has its own distinct theme based off of a different culture or area of the world. You've got your basic fantasy village, basic fantasy city, feudal Japan city, Arabian city, and so on. Each of these areas is visually distinct from one another and really help the game get that whole epic feel that it's trying to deliver. Additionally, each of these villages has a lot of stuff to do with it. You have your inns, your shops, your houses, oh my gosh, why are there so many houses? You have your plot buildings, you got your side quests. No, not the B-plot, the main story, actual side quests. These often boil down to, hey, why is there a dude with a purple circle over his head? Let me go talk to him. Oh, you want me to do some variety of kill things with other things? Grab certain things or talk to certain people? Some of these are dummy and convenient, so I ended up skipping like half of them if they weren't going to give a good reward, ranging from crafting recipes, armor, or money. Anyways, there's often a minigame or something that you can do to waste your time in these cities too. Want to race horses? Again, even though it's kind of janky, go back to Arabian Horse Town. Want to get a head start on your gambling addiction before 21? Go to one of the two casinos in the game and sell your soul to the slot machines. Why are they so fun and why can't I win the jackpot in roulette? I was there for three hours! They're also filled with people to talk to, and they usually have like three sets of dialogue depending on what part of the story you're at. That's so much effort that the devs didn't have to put in, but they did, because they were actually trying to make a good video game. Moving on to the second part of that exploration pillar, we get to the transitional routes. The bread and butter of going from point A to point B, if you will. There's a lot of these, and similarly to the villages, they each manage to feel distinct from one another while also transitioning between these radically different settings. You get a gradient of desert back into plains, which then transitions into a forest, or a forest into a snowy forest into a snowy wasteland, and you get the point. These things are also big, too. Like, there's enough space where you can actually, dare I say, explore. Sometimes the game will give you a different path, and you'll almost always be rewarded with an item or a crafting recipe in a chest for going out of your way to pick it up. Like, that's so cool, you're validating my time and creating a positive feedback loop, making the player more likely to keep doing that. I'm also gonna group the dungeons in here because, honestly, I can't think of a better place for them. There's not many actual dungeons in the game, they're mostly just rooms with monsters in them. And hey, there's nothing wrong with that, we can't all be throwing puzzles in our dungeons to fuck with our players. But even the dungeons have cool themes. There's a dungeon made of solid gold, there's a traditional stone dungeon, there's a dungeon that's a big library and you have to climb to the top. The point I'm trying to get at with the exploration stuff is that each location is really distinct from one another, and none of them really blend together, which is hard to do in a game this big. But Dragon Quest XI really nails it with this, and it really sells the globetrotting aspect. Moving on to the second thing that you're going to be spending most of your time doing in this game, the combat. It feels good. It consists of four of your party members against however many enemies that you're facing. It's pretty standard JRPG turn-based combat, but it managed to keep me engaged for the 90 hours that I sunk into the game. Each of your party members fills a specific role for you. The Luminary can switch between single target damage or burst physical damage with some solid magic backups. Eric is your rogue who can do huge damage through status condition traps. Veronica is your battle mage, Serena is your healing mage, Silvando is your all around, but I personally used him for multi-target physical damage. Rab can be a sage or a fighter, having access to both damage and healing spells. Jade is your fighter, and Aid is your tank. Additionally, each character gets access to a huge skill tree that can let them spec into something completely different. Like, you want Serena to only use lances for some reason? Go ahead, broski. The combinations of the eight party members allows you to pretty much prepare for any kind of battle. For example, in my playthrough, I mostly used Luminary, Eric, Eight, and Rab for stomping through enemies. But for bosses, I used Luminary, Eight, Rab, and Silvando. Almost every character also has a non-damage dealing thing to do in combat. The mages in Silvando can cast status effects like buff and accelerate on the party members, and also apply debuffs. Eric can make a trap that deals damage every turn, and Eight can absorb damage from other party members. This isn't even getting into the pep system, which is similar to limit breaks in Final Fantasy, allowing the characters to do special moves, often accompanied by fun animations. <laughs> Ah! 
What I'm really trying to get at with all my rambling is that even though the combat system may seem like generic turn-based RPG combat, it really takes the formula and fine-tunes it into something fun and engaging, whether it's the first battle or the 1000th. If you didn't know, the character and monster designs for the Dragon Quest series are done by Akira Toriyama, the creator of Dragon Ball. One of the reasons the original NES game performed as well as it did was because of the marketing, saying, hey, this guy did the artwork, you know, this, this dude who uh, made this hugely successful uh, manga series? So 20 years later, Toriyama is still doing the designs, and Dragon Quest XI manages to take his work and seamlessly translate them into a 3D space. The models look smooth, and the animations and the monsters are full of life, and sometimes pretty funny. That's not even touching on how the devs managed to take a PS4 and PC game and make it run almost perfectly on the Switch while not making it look like garbage. I'm not smart enough to tell you what resolution the game runs at, but I can tell you that it looks nice and doesn't have a lot of frame rate issues. Sorry this section's short, I really just can't think of anything besides dur, 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 game pretty. The music for the game and the series as a whole is done by Koichi Sugiyama, and he's sat and done a lot of dumb shit over his life, so I'm just gonna leave it there with him. I'm still gonna talk about the music though, because this game got some bangers, which is important when you're gonna be listening to the same four songs for 100 hours. You walk into any town, bam, town music that flaps so hard it left a bruise. Just walking in the wilderness, bumping to the walking music, and then the combat music still gets me pumped with it. There's also some weird goofy shit that plays during funny moments, and the orchestral versions used for this game are great. Uh, the only problem really, the casino music, is a steaming pile of dog shit that deserves to rot in the corner. Aside from that though, the music really stays out of your player's way and gives them some nice background noise for whatever they're doing. Unless it's farming. Then there's a whole lot of... And now that we talked about how the game plays and looks and sounds, we can get to that thing I mentioned earlier. That's right, the post-game. Ah, the post-game. So, roughly 70 hours into the game, you defeat Mordigan after regaining your party and the six MacGuffins. You beat his ass for real this time, and the world is saved, with the world tree even going back up into the sky and everything. However, immediately after the credits roll, you get to enjoy your victory for about 10 minutes before the group goes, Hey, I know we saved the world, but we really want Veronica back in the party, and you start trying to bring her back to life. Black convenience happens, and you find a way to bring her back to life at a mysterious tower. You go to this tower only to find out that the way you bring people back to life is to go back in time and stop them from dying. Oh boy, time travel. You decide to leave all of your friends behind and go back in time to save Veronica and the world from the Dark One before he can jump you in the world tree by going back to an undetermined point. This is where my biggest problem lies. You have to oh, redo shit. around three hours Where'd worth of content deep? to get back to where you were, and all the character development stuff that you did in Act 2 is gone since Act 2 never happens in the new timeline. All that stuff with Eric's sister, it's optional content. Serena's entire arc of gaining independence, gone. Reduced atoms. It all just goes the fuck away unless you go and look for it, doing things that you already oh, did with less of a reward this time. Sure, the postgame adds things for you to do, like the actual final boss or combat trials, but they don't feel as well made as the rest of the game. Like, for the continuation of the main story, you have to go through these three mega dungeons, which are just areas that you've run oh, through before shit. with harder monsters oh, to I don't mean to sound too negative because I really do love this game, but personally, this I finally got a good PC and with the keep going out of me. I stopped halfway through the third mega dungeon and haven't picked up the game since. 85 hours in though is definitely more than I thought I would get out of the game I knew nothing about. So, where am I at now? Well, I I've been able to sink more time into games lately on top of trying to make videos. I'm about halfway through my first playthrough of The Witcher 3, which I am absolutely loving. Again, only the hottest takes here. Destiny 2's managed to pull me back in with Season 11, so I've been getting on the grind. I did a playthrough of Terraria with some friends since Journey's End came out, and I've mostly been switching between those three games as of late. Playing these games has really gotten me thinking about why I stopped playing video games in the first place. I don't think that I ever really stopped liking video games. I really think that I was only playing shitty games and getting burnt out on them quickly. I used to play a lot of games that looking back on really only feel like cash grabs. Fallout 4 and yearly Call of Duty releases. But there was really something different about Dragon Quest XI that just pulled me back into this hobby. And that would be passion. Every detail of Dragon Quest XI feels like a person made it and liked what they were doing. From the animations, to the dialogue, even the most minute to the gameplay. It all just feels genuine, and it really adds a lot to the game. 
It gives a small connection between the developers and the players that goes, Hey man, check out this game. I made it. I hope you like it. I've read and heard in reviews for the game that Dragon Quest XI is a celebration of the entire series, but due to my lack of experience with the other games, I really can't offer my opinion on that. However, I can restate what I said earlier. However, I can't restate what I said earlier, and that's that this game feels like the people who made it give a shit about the art form of video games. And that honestly goes a long way, when some companies are really just trying to force out shitty RPGs year after year, hoping that no one notices how sloppy the games are getting every year. Anyways, if you haven't played Dragon Quest XI, hopefully I convinced you to pick it up, and if you have played it, maybe I've inspired you to give it a replay. Well, that's pretty much all my rambling. Um, I'm not sure how these videos are going to turn out. I kind of liked this whole process of uh, reviewing a piece of media that I consumed and uh, giving my thoughts about it. Mostly story and characters. I'm pretty fucking bad at writing. I don't know if you noticed, but like, holy shit, they, those last two sections, they were like a minute each. Anyways, uh, I think I'm going to do one of these next month for uh, comic books that I read. Um, and yeah, so uh, I hope you have a good one, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.